All right. Um, so much to cover, and there's a lot that I want to say. Um, but I'm going to focus these next few minutes on the project that I um, am humbled to lead and am by no means the sole driver of um, in central Tanzania in Kondoa. Um, and Kondoa. And I want to talk a lot about the threads of deep history and community joy, um, I think, perhaps after uh, the presentation. Uh, I wanted to mention that um, there are no photos of human remains in this presentation. Um, uh, there is some, uh, sorry, I just wanna make sure I can see the chat in case there is any comments in there. Um, there are some sacred objects, mostly of um, intangible and tangible nature. And uh, I'm also happy to be giving this uh, talk from the unceded lands of Tohono, Tohono Odom and Akimel Odom people and also to be nourished by water, which is brought to me uh, by Hohokam built uh, irrigation canals that are um, over a thousand years old. So um, today I'll be talking a little bit about uh, the work that I've been leading in Kondoa. And like I mentioned previously, uh, I am certainly not the only person uh, who, who leads this project. There are a lot of people uh, who make this work possible. I wanted to talk really briefly just about some of the books that have shaped my work currently. Uh, first here on the left, uh, Mapunda and Msemwa 2002's uh, Salvaging Tanzania's Cultural Heritage, highly recommend. Um, and also more recently, um, Supernaut, Baxter, Lyons, and Adelaide's volume, um, Archaeology of the Heart, I think really ties together a lot of what we've been discussing today about uh, mul uh, recognizing multiple narratives and ontologies um, and not necessarily viewing one uh, knowledge system as superior and really most importantly uh, approaching all of the work that we do um, with our heart and from a heart-centered perspective and so that's something that I try to do uh, in my work as well. Um, in terms of deep history, we haven't had too much of a chance to talk about this. I think we can do that later as well. Um, there are two books here that I just wanted to mention that um, have shaped my thinking about the concept of deep history and why I like that term as opposed to Paleolithic or Pleistocene or prehistory. Um, these are just two books, uh, one by Clive Gamble on the archaeology of deep, of deep human history, and then um, Shryock and Smales. Um, the architecture of past and present. So the um, area that I'll be talking about today is located in Tanzania, um, specifically in central Tanzania, um, in the village of Machingioni. Um, and it's uh, located in between these two other villages, uh, Kisei Sedisa and Itololo. Uh, and before I get um, too far along, I also wanted to mention this important work uh, by Emmanuel Wasiri. This paper was published um, in 2011. And he, in this paper, is talking about some of the systematic failures um, that the heritage management um, officials have experienced in trying to preserve some of the rock art, which I'll speak about in a moment, um, in this area, and really point, uh, summarizing by uh, pointing out the need for um, communities to be engaged and communities to be um, really involved in the decision-making processes um, that go into how uh, these sites are managed and how that hasn't happened yet. And so um, all of this work, um, and of course, Peter Schmidt and Innocent Pickery's volume on community archaeology in Africa um, shaped um, my perspective. So a little bit about the history. Uh, we learned a lot thanks to um, the previous talks um, about some of the Tanzanian history. So Tanzanian uh, independence took place in 1961 of the mainland. Um, and the most common um, ethnic group in central Tanzania where I work is uh, are the Rangi people or Warangi. Uh, their language is Kilangi or Kirangi. Uh, and they comprise about 350,000 people. And I think this is really relevant to some of the questions that we've been discussing previously about, um, you know, which community or communities are we 
referring to when we talk about um, collaborative work. Um, specifically in the Kandoa district, there are also several other groups of people who are represented, including Maasai, Barbeg, Sandawe, Iraq, Burunge, Goroa, Wasi, um, and Mbugwe. And, and so all of these people um, are occupying and living in this place um, at one point in time, even though uh, Rangi people are the most common and that's the most commonly heard language. Um, it, I think it's important to recognize that there are a lot of different people um, present. So Kisete too is a site um, down here um, that has an archeological sequence spanning over 50,000 years. And this is all located in a UNESCO World Heritage Center um, called Kandoa. Um, and it's really known as a, as a World Heritage Center because of the abundant and diverse um, ancient rock paintings that are common in the area. Um, there are over 130 documented paintings. These are just a few examples. This one coming from the site of Kisese II here. Um, I am moving to change the name of this site because uh, it's really, um, it, it was named by the original excavator, who I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but today, because this site is located in Machingioni village, uh, we're thinking about renaming it, um, which, which I can talk about more in a minute. Uh, okay, so the colonial era work in Kondoa really um, was mostly focused on the rock art. Um, and it was led primarily by Lewis and Mary Leakey. And their main aim was to figure out how old um, the rock art was and also who, um, who made the rock art. Uh, this is an image of uh, Ray Inskeep's excavation in 1956. So Inskeep was essentially brought in by the Leakeys um, to excavate at this particular site, Kisese II, because it was one of the only uh, rock shelters that they found in the area that had a long sedimentary sequence. And so they went back there, spent about six weeks and um, went over uh, six meters at the site, um, really all trying to figure out the age of the rock art. Uh, later, Mary Leakey in the 80s came back to the region um, and did a lot of work to study and document the rock art across the region and publish this book, um, basically showing uh, how a lot of the rock art is deteriorating and some of the paintings that she documented um, in her book um, are no longer visible today. So this is still a very pressing issue. And so in 2017, um, I, so I, I should say, um, I've been working in Tanzania since 2008 uh, through my training at the University of Florida. And um, it was in 2017 that I first started working in Kondoa with um, three Tanzanian graduate students, Julia Sugutu, who's currently a PhD student at the University, uh, at Complutense University in Madrid. Um, Husna Mashaka is currently a master's student at the University of Nairobi and will, inshallah, I'll be starting her PhD in the fall at the University of Florida. And then also uh, Sarah Molel, who is a recent archaeology graduate from the University of Dar es Salaam and is um, currently working on our project um, in Dar es Salaam. So the four of us, and also Nema Munisi is pictured here, um, started this, this project that I'll be describing um, in 2017. Um, and our aims were really to prioritize the local community agenda before the international research agenda. Um, building on a lot of the work that has already been talked about today, um, really to build capacity within Tanzanian heritage management and also within paleoanthropology. And finally, ultimately, um, to help uh, steward the Kondoa deep history record, which is um, rapidly vanishing. And so we've done this through a variety of different methods, which I'll just really quickly summarize. Uh, mostly through a, or completely through a community-led collaborative approach. Um, you can see here at the top, we do have a lot of visits. We're completely open to the public at any time, and a lot of people do come by and visit. Um, and so this is an image of one of the antiquities representatives describing the importance of not touching the rock art, for example, 
a lot of people will splash water on it to make it more visible. And so he here's a photo of uh, Donna, uh, Dr. Dennis Sandgate um, giving um, a presentation about um, how some of these sites are preserved in France. And we're working on um, creating some new methods for preserving the QCC2 locality, um, building on those methods. So really we are um, a network of students, educators, researchers, and um, heritage stakeholders from across the country. All of us um, studying and preserving the deep history of the Kandoa region um, in central Tanzania and really reflect reflexively examining and shifting the positionality of foreign colonial descendant team members. Uh, something that we've talked about quite a bit today um, and how to do that, uh, we've used sort of the first pillar of transparency. So um, for example, when I first started working there, very um, explicit, explicitly explaining um, you know, how I benefit from this work, we talked about how um, academic uh, stakeholders sometimes have their own research agenda. And so I thought, you know, being very transparent about what, um, what previous work had been done at the site and why. And so I did that um, through these community me uh, meetings and also through um, translating. So one of the first things we did is we took um, basically any publication about the site in the area and we translated it into Swahili, printed the, out multiple copies and uh, distributed those into the community. And we were very surprised to find that um, work that was done in the 1950s, really very few people today had um, any knowledge of that. And they really didn't have any knowledge of what had been found, including multiple um, burials. So that was really the first step, which took several seasons and which we are still doing through uh, these open community um, meetings. It's pr primarily Muslim community. Um, and the site you can see is uh, in the distance. We do also meet a lot with the elected officials, both the community elected and government appointed um, officials um, every week to make sure that um, everyone's um, goals and needs are being heard. And then, like I mentioned previously, um, the excavation in the lab is always open. And so we have a lot of visitors coming by to learn about uh, what we do. This is Julia Sagutu explaining how excavation happens with a trowel, not with a shovel. Um, so in terms of some of the community needs, uh, one of the first things that people requested was um, help with a primary school which we were able to use grant money um, from the Leakey Foundation to um, construct, I have an after photo, which I can share later, uh, to construct a roof onto this building, um, which the community is now using um, for various uh, reasons, and including as a school. Um, all of the excavators and the entire research team um, is completely community um, elected. So, um, Community members will nominate people to join the, the team where they will build skill sets. And then also this has become a very crucial position because um, the elected uh, team members will then go back and share their findings uh, with everyone else. I didn't mention previously, but um, there's a very common gold narrative here, uh, where which I think has colonial or origins uh, where people think that um, Germans buried gold in some of these rock shelters. And so uh, reframing that narrative is part of, uh, and understanding that narrative is, is part of what we're doing. And so um, having the community elected um, team members to be part of that conversation has been crucial. And then everything that we uh, do at the site from the food supplies um, to the water is all obtained from and shared with um, the people who live around the site, including local farmers um, and business owners. And um, a few more methods that I wanted to mention um, that we've moved towards recently, um, all communications uh, for the entire team uh, happen on Slack. And this is explicitly to, to prevent some of the kind of 
side conversations that happen often um, in academic spaces, like hallway conversations that often do exclude um, specifically Tanzanian researchers in this case. Uh, so that's why we make sure that all of the communications are fully open on Slack. Um, there are no backroom handshake deals or anything like that. Everything is voted upon, discussed, and edited in an open forum. Um, the Waze Wamila, uh, Ichimbaki mentioned Waze previously. Um, these are elders in the Rangi community who are um, experts in traditional knowledge, and they oversee everything that we do, and they are also integrated. Um, with the leadership of our project. And the leadership of the KDHB also um, integrates community elected um, and government appointed officials from the national to the village level. Um, and student training is a core mission. And I think um, Ijimbaki mentioned this previously, um, it's important that we're all learners. So we try to do away with this kind of hierarchy of having professors um, and graduate students and really remember that um, everyone on this team is a learner. Um, so just to summarize some of the work that we've done in the last four years or five years, um, we found that deep history and community joy really are intrinsically connected in Kundoa, which I'd be happy to talk about more in the discussion. Um, also that colonial legacies shape the current practice and need to be examined. I think we've seen this at Olduvai and um, several other um, areas that we've discussed today. And really, to me, um, this is about leveraging power. Um, Dr. Steves mentioned earlier about um, this is the work that she was given. And I, I feel very strongly um, with that, uh, related to that, that this work is not necessarily something that I ever thought I would necessarily do, but I do see it as an opportunity to leverage power and to share power and to um, meet community needs and steward a uh, vanishing heritage. And uh, I also wanted to mention that it takes time and effort to build some of these key relationships. Um, it takes time to learn the language, to understand the history, um, and it's taken, you know, and, and it's a never ending uh, process as well. And with that, I just wanna say thank you to everyone uh, here today. It's really incredible to hear all of your work and to um, see it all come together. And I especially wanna thank the people in Machingioni who um, can contribute to this work every day and make it possible. Uh, one of my uh, mentors, Fidelis Masao, as well as Emmanuel Basiri and Masana Buire, um, Amber Wudich, Alex Brewis, and Sharice Jonas for helping to put this entire thing together and these funding agencies. Oh, and then if you're interested, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram here at Emrati Wa Kondoa. Thank you. I was like, the people still there? It's hard to tell if people are there. Um, I think we should maybe move on to the next.